Good afternoon, Bojo, Wache, Ani. Welcome to Lakehead University speaker session, Missing Children, What Does This Mean for Canada? Denise Baxter and Dishnakas, Makwad Odom, Martin Falls and Donjaba. My name is Denise Baxter, Vice Provost, Indigenous Initiatives at Lakehead University. Um, I would like to thank everyone who joined, who is joining us today and for accepting the invitation to come together to, to speak about this uh, important and difficult topic. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the lands that we are gathered on. Lakehead University respectfully acknowledges that our campuses are located on the traditional lands of Indigenous peoples. Lakehead University Thunder Bay is located on the traditional lands of Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Spirit Treaty of 1850. Lakehead Aurelia is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwa, Odawa and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We acknowledge the history that many nations hold in the areas around our campuses, and we are committed to a relationship with Métis, First Nation, and Inuit peoples, based on the principles of mutual trust, respect, reciprocity, and collaboration in the spirit of reconciliation. Before we begin, I would like to run through a few housekeeping items. Uh, the first being, it's important to note that this will be recorded today. Participants are reminded that this online event um, is being recorded and will be shared in our Indigenous Initiatives webpage on Lakehead University's YouTube channel. And we are doing this to preserve a record of the event <clears throat> in the university's archives and to publicize and promote Lakehead University. The convocations are, are sorry, these are uh, important events and we want to make sure that we are able to host a record for this. And so by attending, you are agreeing to be included in the recording and it's public dissemination in any media now or known or later developed anywhere in the world in perpetuity. Thank you for joining us. Um, also just to know that uh, all, particip all participants will be muted um, through the event until the point where we um, have a, a forum for people to um, to speak, share comments, and uh, engage with Dr. Wesley Eskimo. It is my pleasure uh, today to introduce Dr. Cynthia Wesley Eskimo, the Chair on Truth and Reconciliation at Lakehead University. She was appointed in 2016 to advocate for truth and reconciliation initiatives within the Lakehead University community, while serving as an ambassador on the truth and reconciliation issues in Northwestern Ontario and Simcoe County, and also at the provincial and national levels. The Chair on Truth and Reconciliation highlights and furthers Lakehead University's strategic and academic plans to ensure Lakehead responds appropriately and effectively to the 94 calls to action outlined, outlined in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. Uh, Dr. Wesley Eskima serves on many uh, national committees, heads up organizations that she herself has founded, and plays an integral role in the work that we do um, at Lakehead University and uh, within our surrounding regions. So it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Cynthia Wesley Eskimo. All right, can you hear me okay? Just give me a yes. Yes, yes we can. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I just wanna thank you all. I, I wanna acknowledge each one of you for cho choosing to attend today. And I wanna thank you for your interest, your compassion and your caring for this very uh, important conversation. There's been so much heard across the country and we're all affected, even if we're not Indigenous. I've talked to many people over the last couple of weeks uh, who are not Indigenous, who are just so concerned. In fact, I think it was the University of Alberta has a MOOC, uh, uh, an online uh, tra training program, and they said that the, the week of the discovery at Kamloops, 39,000 people registered because they wanted to know more. So it's clearly it's, uh, you know, we see this, uh, this conversation as this significant step towards awakening the Canadian population to the truth about Indian residential schools in Canada and Indian hospitals, which also played a significant role in this national tragedy. So before I begin, I want to note, I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to lay down some uh, conversation for you, some facts, some information. And what I really want from you uh, at the end of uh, my speaking is I want you to ask questions. I want you to, you know, put it in the chat or just you know directly ask and, and we'll try to do the best we can as a team to answer you. But I really want you to feel like this is your conversation and you're a part of it. Uh, I can't see you, I'm gonna be actually using notes. So I just wanna be able to say, I'm gonna give you that information. Then we're gonna have a chat. We can talk about the calls to action or uh, any of those things. But let me just tell you a little bit about this story so that you have the background and then we'll go from there. I also wanna note 
that I'm a proud member and resident of the Chippewa Zojutin Island First Nation in Lake Simcoe. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the original lands of the Chippewa. I'm on my First Nation community and have been for several weeks now. And I want to know, you to know that that's where I'm coming from. This session is an exchange process. So I'm going to share some information. Please feel free to ask questions. So the two things that need to be done immediately. The first is to uncover the full truth and to identify all of the children who never returned home. It's a paramount step is for all records relevant to the Indian residential schools across Canada to be finally released without delay and without litigation. This is what needs is, is needed to document the full truth. Uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission interviewed something like 7,000 people. They testified before them, and, they, and we have those records at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. I'm presently the chair for the governing circle, and I work very closely with them. We also have records from the, uh, the independent adjudication, adjudication process, which also uh, identified and interviewed several thousand people. We are not we do not have those records, and those are the records that are actually subject to being destroyed. In fact, they would have been destroyed already uh, because they were uh, supposedly destroyed before March 2021, and we have a stay on that, and we're still involved in that litigation and asking that those records be, be preserved for the future. So that's an important part of the conversation. We can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I want to say that my heart goes out to all of the families of the children who perished at the Kamloops Residential School and all children who did not return home. This is a time of great mourning across the country. It's also an opportunity to finally do the work to locate the children who were taken away, never to return home. And it is our sincere hope that what the Kamloops people have accomplished in locating these 215 children will be a moment where all Canadians embrace the truth and act with genuine commitment towards reconciliation. And the fact of the matter is more have been found since Kamloops. Brandon Manitoba has, has announced another 107 children. Saskatchewan has announced another 93. And I'm sure as we move forward day by day, there will be more because there are at least 128 communities across Canada that are currently involved in this in this particular action. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. We hope that out of this particular tragedy, we'll see concerted national action to locate and honor all First Nations, Métis and Inuit children who perished as a result of the residential school system, the Indian hospital system, which we haven't even had a conversation about yet, but is coming because this is another important part uh, of the conversation. There were 22 Indian hospitals across Canada that were actually related to the residential school system. They took in the children who were dying or suffering from tuberculosis. And also at the time uh, there was a lot of race, well, there's still a lot of racism, but uh, non-Native people did not want Indians in their hospitals. So they had to set up separate hospitals for Indians very much like they did with the black community in the United States. Uh, and also, uh, we have to look at today's child welfare system, which is another system that is 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 continuing the the, uh, the taking of our children, and and of course has contributed to the death of many children as well. So those uh, it, that information is urgently needed and long overdue. The second thing that needs to be done is to uphold Indigenous protocols around mourning. Indigenous communities have to have the opportunity to determine for themselves what ceremonies and commemorations are necessary and appropriate to honor the children who died and never returned home. For years, the Canadian government denied Indigenous people the freedom to practice our sacred ceremonies and cultural practices. The residential school system had one, if not the largest role in reinforcing this. Survivors have shared that residential schools had a detrimental impact on their ability to grieve. It is therefore necessary that communities be supported to bring in knowledge keepers and elders to undertake the ceremonies that were so long denied to the missing children, their families, and their communities. I still remember being in a remote community in, in Northern Ontario during a time of a very great loss when several children had committed suicide. And I remember asking the people, why, you know, why are you not crying or, or making like noise? They were all sitting very silently in this room. And they said to me, you know, that the church had, had forbid it, forbidden it, that they could not, you know, they used to cry and scream and uh, rend their hair and and they used to express themselves when they mourned and they said they weren't allowed to and this is something again a legacy effect from the residential school systems and of, of the church who told people you cannot mourn like that because it is too noisy or whatever it was and so I was just totally shocked by that so 
I also want to underline that TRC's call to action 76, which says that indigenous people must be able to lead in the development of strategies for documenting, maintaining, commemorating, and protecting residential school cemeteries. In view of the uh, National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, the Governing Circle and the Survivor Circle, whose guidance leads the work that we do, hiding, damaging, interfering with, or destroying the graves of residential school children must be recognized as a crime and prosecuted as such. In addition, national standards must be put in place concerning the use of investigative technologies, such as ground scanning radar, to ensure the privacy of affected families is respected and to ensure that any evidence of crimes is not compromised. And this is going to be a very important part of this conversation because it's, again, we don't want another cover-up happening as the communities are moving forward to actually uncover those burials. We don't want other people like the churches and that coming in and say, you know, we can't, you can't look in so far we're getting it. You can't look here. You can't look there. So it's going to be very important for all of Canadians to actually be a part of this conversation. Finally, all measures to investigate and protect burial sites must be consistent with the rights of Indigenous people in domestic and international law, including the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And again, we can also come back to the, the United Nations Declaration as an important uh, tool for actually getting this work done. The Federal Minister uh, for Crown and Indigenous Relations, uh, uh, Minister Carolyn Bennett, announced that previously allocated funding for the investigation of grave sites would finally be made available to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis governance and communities. In making the announcement, she told reporters that Indigenous peoples weren't ready for the money to be released before. I believe that they, in fact, are and have been for a while now, and this needs to be honoured. $33 million was allocated from the Treasury Board for this work to be done. Uh, there's about 24 million, I think, that has not been allocated out, but it is out there and it is it is moving, uh, but there needs to be more. The National Center, survivors and our partners have been working within frameworks of collaboration. And we've talked to other universities like about doing this together. Respect, there has to be respect for diverse Indigenous protocols. Not all Indigenous peoples are the same. Their protocol ceremonies vary very broadly, languages broadly, and we have to do something to honour that. There needs to be adherence to the guidance of survivors and knowledge keepers. The federal government has been told time and time again that the need for action is urgent. We need to know this now. The National Centre and Indigenous communities have been desperate to begin meaningful action in locating grave sites, but have been severely under-resourced. Lakehead has had a hand in this search, the Department of Anthropology and Anthropology, sorry, and Scott Hamilton. So we, you know, I think that we need to be re respected and recognized that we have actually made efforts to be a part of this conversation at Lakehead. We've made progress on this journey towards truth, reconciliation, and healing. The Kamloops School has brought into focus just how much more work we have to do as a country. Communities are actively engaged in this, but as a country, as Canada, there needs to be more. It's going to require genuine, sustained action to meet the obligations to right this terrible wrong. The federal government, the provincial governments, the territorial governments, and the churches all have a profound responsibility to act now. In fact, we're working, I'm working with a group um, from through the National Center on a covenant of reconciliation with several churches, and we're designing something that refutes the doctrine of discovery that says the churches have a, a stated obligation and responsibility to be a part of this conversation, uh, but the Catholic Church is not a part of that conversation. They have not joined us. So that's an important part of this discussion as well. So, uh, survivors have consistently said that before we can meaningfully talk about reconciliation, we must have truth and we must have healing. And that is what has been denied to First Nations, Inuit, Métis families and communities. And this has to change without delay and without hiding behind litigation. Until this does change, the healing journey will be, remain incomplete and we will continue to see the issues and concerns that come up in our communities because there's so much damage that has been done that has not been resolved. But I believe it is our collective responsibility and we need everyone in Canada to participate in this conversation. So call to action 72 specifically calls on the federal government to allocate sufficient resources to the National Center of Truth and Reconciliation to allow us to maintain the National Register, National Register, oh, I can't say this, National Residential School Student Death Registrar. And while this has been done, there is additional funding required to assist those communities who need supports outside their own community efforts. And many of them do come to the National Center 
to ask uh, from the elders and other people to support the work that they're doing. Not everybody has the capacity in their own communities to actually engage in this very important conversation. Uh, the resources uh, need to be allocated so that they can actually get those ground scanners to come into their communities. Uh, where they're, you know, because a lot of the residential schools were situated very close to First Nation communities, not all of them, but they want to do the work themselves. They want to lead it. They want their elders to be a part of the conversation, their survivors. So it's an important part of this uh, conversation. So between the work with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and the National Centre on Truth and Reconciliation, uh, we were able to confirm 4,117 deaths of children in the residential schools. Um, Murray Sinclair has personally said that he believes there's more like five or 6,000 children that have actually been missing. Like, and these are, so one of the things you need to understand is about 150,000 children went into the Indian residential schools during the years that it ran. Seven generations of uh, families were affected by this. About 50% of the children that went into those schools either died at the schools or uh, shortly after they got home from those schools or in, in Indian hospitals. So it's really important that you understand the numbers. And, you, and when you look at your own children, you think about the fact that these children were taken from their families as small children. You know, Some of the children at the uh, Kamloops um, burial site were uh, three years old. And uh, my stepfather went to residential school when he was four years old. And he stayed there till he was 16 years old. And he had some very horrific experiences as well. So this is about children. I know sometimes when you look at the people, the survivors, they're all elderly mostly, and they're all gray haired and they go, but these were children. So this is really important because the number of children believed to have gone missing is much higher than the 4,000 we have identified. And of course, this is being confirmed as we speak as the, as the communities actually engage in this, in this process. So record keeping for the schools was nowhere near today's standards, nor were they consistent. So review the records already and the National Center's collection is still ongoing. And I'm sure uh, we'll find more children in those records as we move forward, but sometimes it's very difficult. Uh, sometimes um, children were not buried uh, in their own communities. They were sent to another community buried there. So a significant piece, is piercing together the evidence that remains with the survivors and their families. So we're trying to work on that today. Survivors continue to come forward with accounts of deaths that they witnessed. Uh, this is part of the reason why we know that these children are missing. Uh, many of the survivors have talked for many, many, many years about the children that they saw uh, kicked down the stairs or um, are buried or were a part of, um, um, and again, I don't want to say so many things that will scare you, but there were some terrible things that happened at these at these schools. So many of them are in unmarked graves, but there are also accounts of bodies that were buried in walls, buried in the hills or by riversides, under trees, bodies that were never found after children died trying to escape the schools. Uh, they ran away in, you know, as you know, schools happen in the wintertime. So there was a lot of children that didn't get buried or didn't make it back to these particular sites. So these sites are regarded as crime scenes. And the uh, discovery of, at Kamloops has triggered an irritated scene survivors and the families to share the truth while they still can. Uh, Joyce Hunter comes to mind. That Joyce Hunter is a, is a, is a young woman in uh, Thunder Bay. And I remember her story very clearly about her, her, her younger brother who was uh, who died at residential school and they, they buried him in another community and um, they wanted him back to their own community and the federal government would not provide the resources to enable them to do that. So it was very upsetting for her father who, um, who wanted his son to be buried in, uh, in their community. And I think they struggled for many, many years to try to get that achieved. And uh, as I understand, it was the public that actually came together and provided the resources to exhume uh, the, her younger brother and bring him back, fly him back to Thunder Bay and they took him home. And his, her father died shortly thereafter. I think he was waiting. So there's, sorry, I get emotional with that. There's so many stories like that where they needed to have that. So we don't know what communities will decide concerning repatriating children to their homes. We don't know what they will choose to do, but it has to be a choice of the families and the communities. I want to underscore, though, that the committee uh, to, to, to you as, as participants and to those of you that have an interest that are not necessarily Indigenous, but certainly to the Indigenous community, that the urgency of documenting what survivors witnessed or what families have shared about missing loved ones is, is important. It's paramount in, what, in the work that we're trying to do. And we are racing against time because we often hear from survivors that they say that they have fewer tomorrows than they had yesterday's. 
And we need to honor this as Canadians that, that a lot of the survivors, and there are some younger survivors because some of the residential schools closed in the late 1990s. And so they're not old, they're in their 30s and 40s. But they're most of the survivors that we have working with us at the National Center and the, uh, are, are elderly. And we need to honor the fact that they have fewer tomorrows. We know that the Kamloops Residential School is, is, uh, is one school in over 140 across this country. So again, for those of you that don't know how many schools there were, there was about 140 schools across the entire country, across Canada, many of them in the Prairie Provinces. 128 communities have already begun the emotionally wrenching work of finding unmarked burial sites. We're only at the very beginning of recognizing the extent, extent of the horrific loss of precious lives that have been covered up. And I guess the question is, you know, what will Canada do to rectify this, this national wrongdoing? And what does it mean for Canada on the world stage? And those questions are really important for us as Canadians, or people who call themselves Canadians. Not everybody does. The Mohawk community does not. But we have to recognize that this country who has often regarded itself as a peacekeeper on the world stage, you know, as a country that has actually um, wasn't as bloody as the United States uh, in, you know, in the elimination of uh, the indigenous population from, from, its, from its lands. Uh, the, you know, the treaty process was, it was quite different here in Canada. The, um, that all of the lands were still taken and many of the treaty responsibilities obligations were not fulfilled. We are in the process of actually creating those land claims and ensuring that um, that, that, that exchange and that recognition and acknowledgement is done. But Canada is still on the hook for actually rectifying the national wrong. We will not be getting to reconciliation until we actually fully have the truth that we have been talking about over the last least 20 years. And we still have a long way to go. The work ahead is very extensive. And I also feel it's important for Canadians to recognize that at this point, there is no ongoing federal commitment after the initial 33 million now being allocated to support and maintain the necessary community work or uh, external to community sports or archival and record keeping and all of the things that the National Centre does and other places across Canada, there is no additional funding for this. So I think in this instance, when it comes to, you know, what can you do as a Canadian citizen what do you do as a visitor? We have many international students at Lakehead, and I think that that's important. Someone, you know, as someone that has a lot of advantage or privilege, um, I, you know, I don't think I, I don't think in the terms of you know all non-native or white people have privilege, and and we don't. We all have various forms of advantage or privilege, you know, wherever we are, and what we do you know, certainly as academics and people that are working in the university system. But I need you to think about speaking up. I need you to consider the fact that we do too much bystanding in this, in this country and in other places in the world. Um, there's a lot happening with the Asian community has being attacked because of the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 virus, uh, which I think is patently unfair. It's not their fault. The Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, you know, has been, it's not just the United States, it's also Canada. You know the uh, whole question around uh, being being non-native and being you know you're not maybe you don't have any privileges or maybe you're not you know you're not a wealthy person, and of course the indigenous population, which has been fighting I think valiantly for the last 500 years to be heard and to be uh, understood. I know that the uh, the first team of people that went forward to the courts um, on the Indian residential school. Uh, experience that they had, a hor horrific experience, by I've heard it, the Blackwater brothers were, were called liars by the court. They were told that you're lying. There's no way that that could happen in Canada. And, uh, and they had to keep going back to the court many times and, and they were finally then vindicated and they were heard. It's been an interesting piece that in Canada, the indigenous population is always on the hook to prove what they're saying, whether it's about a land claim and that Canada counter researches everything we say, uh, whether it's about Indian residential schools and the stories that the, that the survivors uh, were able to tell, and now missing children and burials that, you know, when Kamloops came forward and there was proof that there were children that were not, had not been identified by the church because the Catholic church actually said that there were 50, 50, 51 children that had been buried there. Uh, they did not identify the other you know, 150 children that had, were actually there. So this is an important consideration. So no more bystanding, no more saying, oh, I don't know, it's got nothing to do with me. These were children. And you can do your best to learn about the true history of this country. Take the time to read a book 
to listen to a video, to watch a movie that is a good one. Um, the Revenant, um, um, I remember watching The Revenant and, and seeing you know, traders dragging around these little Indian girls in a bar and thought, you know what, we don't need that anymore. That just says things to people in, in a subliminal way that somehow Indigenous women are meant to be like that. And it is so not true. And it has caused so much hurt with the missing and murdered Indigenous women, men, boys, girls, everybody. We cannot start, we cannot believe those things anymore. They're just stereotypes and, and untruths that need to be undone. You can challenge those who naysay or reject the truth. You can challenge them. But let me just share what, um, uh, um, as I, I'm gonna close and I, I wanna spend the last half hour having you ask questions and just having a dialogue with you. Uh, I was talking to former prime minister, Paul Martin. This is probably about four years ago. And he said, you know, you know, and I was explaining to him the challenges of doing reconciliation work, the challenges of getting the truth out there and the challenges of getting Canadian citizens to appreciate and respect the fact that there has been so much damage done in this country. And he said to me, you know, Cynthia, it's kind of like this. 40% of the population of Canada is on side. They understand that some terrible things have happened. They want to be a part of the solution. They believe that this is the truth and they're there waiting for a call in to do something that's going to be helpful. 30% of the population, they don't give a damn. They don't want to hear about it. They don't care. They will shut you out. And he said, and 30% of the population is sitting on the fence. You know, he said, so you need to forget about the 30% in the middle because you're probably not going to change their minds. And what you really need to do is work with the 40% who are on side, the 30% who are on the fence, bring them together, build critical mass so that you have a, a larger proportion of people who want to know the truth, who want to participate in solutions, work with them and start the process of whether it's legislation or whether it's educate, shifting education, you know, whatever it might be, work with them and you will get to the place where you need to go. Will we do it in our lifetime? I'm not so sure that that's going to happen, but I'll tell you, there's been many people across the entire country who have dedicated their entire lives to trying their level best to make it so. And I think we'll, you know, we have to continue doing that. We have to continue to work together and ensure that we have, actually have the opportunity to do to be a better Canada, and to and to ensure that this kind of situation never happens again. Because when we bury the truth, when we burn the records, when we destroy the Indigenous adjudication, the uh, in, sorry, independent adjudication process records, which are the very personal stories of people who actually came forward and told some very serious, very hard. Some of them died after this because they were so re-traumatized by it. Those stories, you know, we have a right to preserve those stories into the future. They should not be destroyed because people didn't want um, other people to know about it. And, and the reason for that is some people that were um, actually uh, perpetrators, they want the records destroyed because they don't want anybody to know. And I know that people didn't go home and say, I raped a little girl today. You know, there's a lot of people across the country who have ancestors who worked in those schools at various points. They don't even know that. They don't know that they're descendants. And then there are people that, that were perpetrators that were indigenous student on student abuses who are still working in our communities who don't want people to know that history. So that's why the records were, you know, it was demanded that the records be destroyed. And we have done half the work here by identifying the children that died, by identifying the survivors, by working with them as carefully and as fully as possible. We have not done any real work on the other side with the churches, the nuns, the priests, you know, teachers that were engaged in this, the caregivers that were in the, in the dorms. We haven't really identified that. And, and part of the reason is because this is focused very much on the indigenous population. So those are things that you can think about. Those are things that have happened. And as, as I said earlier, I don't want to, I mean, I don't have students on here. I don't want to tell you know, some of the story. I mean, I know lots of stories. I've had lots of occasion to speak to survivors. Both my parents went to residential school for 20 years between them. I grew up in a household that was you know, very deeply impacted by those experiences. And we need to know more and, and so we can help our children because again um, when you look at the adverse childhood experiences or epigenetics that we're now studying to help solve this those impacts they say can last as many as 14 generations so even if you feel pretty good 
like you've stepped away from some of that pain, it's still being carried genetically forward. So we have lots of work to do as human beings to ensure that we don't continue to pass it to our children, even when we're not, you know, even when we're trying not to, we still have that genetic message. And so we have to really think carefully about how we parent and how we break those cycles. So I'll leave it at that. I want to be able to have you ask questions for the last part of this and, and please feel free to, uh, we'll do everything we can to answer the kinds of the questions. And if we can't, we'll, you know, we'll ensure that we come back to you and, and try to provide you with that detail. All right, so I'm gonna leave it there and then uh, please start uh, whoever's moderating the questions. Thank you very much um, for sharing all of that with us. Um, I would like to invite people to either put their questions in the chat or um, if they would like to raise their hand, I'll do my best to go through the 168 people on the list to find you. It might be quicker to use the, the chat pod if you have questions. Um, our first question, uh, we did have a general question around recommendations for uh, good films, documentaries, and books. So I had put some links in there. Um, I see we have Michelle DeRosier um, yeah. joining us today as well. And I also put her IMD in there. Uh, the most recent movie I had seen by her was Grandfather Drum, but there are uh, a lot of uh, film and doc documentary films um, within her um, roster as well. That really, I, I found to be very informative. I think we can provide that. I mean, I can certainly provide you with a book list and we can make sure that you get that. And, I, and you know, I'm sure everybody at Lakehead has, has that, but we can make sure that you get that book list. Um, we can also, I'll, I'll put a list together. Of the, I, hadn't, I have a list of the videos, but it's not moved over to a list that I can send. So I'll, I'll make sure that that gets sent as well. So okay, that you wonderful. can take a look at them. Yeah. Thank you. And we will uh, share that out with all the registrations through your registration email. Yeah, so do we that. do have um, Edna Howard, uh, who has her hand raised, if we can have Edna ask a question. Where is she? Oh, there you are. Oh, you're on mute, oh, you're on mute Edna. There okay. you go. There you go. Hi, Cynthia. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, you know, I was, I, we, so we have been doing a little bit of work on our end since our last, um, our last interaction, because we did a panel interview with, uh, with you and then, the, and then the discovery happens. So there's, there is, uh, <clears throat> there's some, there's some changes in, in, in the introduction of the video. But anyways, um, you know what I was thinking and listening to your presentation, and you're and and I, I'm really interested in the in epigenetics. I I know because one thing that I've known in my family, uh, there's about 500 or so of us in the Grand Cache area, and we like my parents were not in residential schools, um, and and then but further behind that, like if you look back at the generations. Um, my grandparents weren't, but then beyond that, we don't know. But it's so it's really interesting to hear the 14 generations and the impacts because yeah. it's definitely, like you said in your in your in your in your personal um, in your personal share, is that like we've been impacted. I remember growing up in the 70s, like the, the community was decimated with the social problems, the alcoholism, and then you know we still are feeling the the impacts of that. So. Um, is there any good books that you know of that would really speak to epigenetics? Because that's something that I would really be interested in, in continuing to learn about and, and really sharing. Because for some of us that didn't have that direct impact, but we are still being, being impacted because it, it, it really is part of our genetic makeup. And I guess the other thing is how do we do that? And how do we, how, how do we continue having those conversations? And how do we, what do we need to do to make sure we we diminish or we decrease the impact. Yeah, the, um, uh, there's a couple, there's books on the list that I've given you that are, that are actually from uh, doctors like Dr. Bruce Perry, who does a lot of work in epigenetics. The thing about epigenetics is really interesting because there's the gene and the epi is just like the piece that's on top that gets stimulated. So if you come into a domestic violence situation as a baby, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're pregnant and you're in under a lot of stress because you're, you're in a domestic violence situation, 
the, the, the hormonal chemicals that are being bathed over the baby are, are preparing that child to come into a difficult situation. So they, they, they're born ready. So now we've already stimulated in the wrong direction. And if it continues, we're stimulating that child in the, in, in the, in the wrong direction and they're going to be, you know, we're heading them off to addictions and all kinds of other issues. If you have the calm, the traditional manner of raising pregnancy, having the pregnancy was peaceful, quiet, support, nurturing, you know, people loving that mother into through her pregnancy. So the baby's calm Then the baby's born into a situation where they're calm. And then you start stimulating and teaching and learning in that, and you know, that direction, you're breaking that cycle more than you are if your child is being born into a situation. So the, the goal as parents is to keep as everything as calm as possible so that the child is born into a calm situation and has a chance to not have the stimulation in the wrong direction. It's, but the epi is something that they can actually change today. It's a very fascinating study, uh, CRISPR it's called. So uh, there are some um, articles there that you can, uh, we can include. It will help you understand it better, yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to go back and forth um, between the questions that are written and people with their hands up. Um, so the next question is, is there a plan to ramp up the educational process for those who remain generally ignorant like preparing school education materials, train teachers and full programs at the elementary and high school levels, but by Indigenous educators and authors and with Indigenous perspectives. Yeah, I'm working as fast as I can. <laughs> I do a lot of that, exactly that kind of education. That's my job. I'm educating on a regular basis across Canada and helping non-Indigenous people and, in, and our, peop our own people understand what, what's going on. So I'm trying to get rid of myself and I'm not having luck. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, um, there is absolutely, it was one of the criticisms I had of the missing and murdered Indigenous women uh, uh, inquiry was there was no real public education process. And I think we need a national public education process because people do want to know, as I said, about the 39,000 that actually registered themselves at the University of Alberta. People do want to know, but they want it. They want to know it in a way that doesn't make them feel ashamed or blamed. And, and that's a challenge to, to give some really difficult material and background and not have people feel badly. Like we just, it's not about that. It's just, let's educate you so that you have a history here and you understand that we're not trying to trash Canada. We're not trying to trash, you know, non-Indigenous people or the church even. We're trying to say, look, some terrible things have happened. There needs to be a resolution and a rest restoration process here because people are still struggling. They're still hurting. And we're still, you know, we're still having children born into our families that are coming into difficult situations, as Edna had pointed out. And we don't really want, you know, we don't want that. We want, you know, so we're asking for better education, better funding for our own educations, because that really helps. We've seen, you know, educated mothers, healthier children. We, you know, we, we know that that's the case. Uh, we want our men to be given an opportunity to do the healing work that they have. And, and, and quite often in the past, men have been ex, ex excluded from a healing you know we have lots of things for mothers and women and we have very few things for men to actually do the kind of work that they need to do they hurt just as much and hurt people hurt people so we want to be able to get to the young men and, and we want to be able to uh, encourage the teacher education to take that on to social work uh, training to take that on i work with uh, the doctor sometimes i work with uh, bioethics i work with a lot of different kinds of uh, I'm working, I've been asked to look at the whole question of palliative care. You know, how do we do, how do we help people die in a good way so that they have a cultural support? You know, everybody's kind of coming at it from different perspectives. I just talked to the Ministry of Natural Resources. You know, they wanna know how they can better inform their, their uh, the people in the field who are in direct contact with indigenous people when they're, when they're hunting and fishing. So they do a better job and just don't attack or arrest or whatever. So there's lots going on, I think that is really important and, and we just need to do more of it. Thank you. Um, this is uh, from a neighbor of yours, Mim. Uh, she says, hi, Cynthia, good to see a neighbor's face. Great words. Uh, <laughs> what are some good solid actions that first people or settlers can do that will really help? Some of us are working hard, <laughs> as you've just <laughs> indicated, <laughs> but some are still wondering what they can do. Well, I think you can, you can, I, I think the best thing for you to do, especially if you, it doesn't, I think, well, I think it matters, especially if you're not Indigenous, but I think it doesn't matter, is educate yourself first 
and then open up a small circle around you. You know, if you're a part of a church, you know, do some public speaking at your church, bring in some readable materials, uh, maybe share a video, like work locally first. You know, and you're in, and, I, and I've sat with, um, I remember there was uh, three churches that came together in uh, the Orangeville area. And we had like 40 people in the room in a big circle. And we had a conversation about this and people just asked questions and, you know, we answered and we went all the way around the circle and people left feeling heard and, and better educated. I spoke to the Aurora Cultural Center the other day, which is non-Indigenous mostly. Again, they just want to know, please help us understand. And when you can understand, I think it gives you compassion. And I've said to people, it's very hard to teach compassion and empathy. You need the experience to get to the compassion. How do you get to the experience without actually taking yourself out of your own little space and learning something different? Um, I had a police chief say to me, I, I read lots of reports on missing and murdered Indigenous women. And I thought, okay, yeah, that's a really bad thing. He said, one day I went to a conference with other police officers and six Indigenous women came in and told us their story personally. He said, after that, I got it. He said, I, I, I under, finally understood how, how important it was and how deep it went. I couldn't get that from a, the page of a book. I couldn't get it. But I sure got it when these women came before me and told me their stories. And I, and I saw the, the emotion in their bodies and I heard their tears and I saw the, you know, I got, I got it. So the experience is very important to build the compassion that's necessary to, to look at other people in a good way. Because... That's what's really going to be important is we can, that we can see each other as human beings. And when I did the missing and murdered Indigenous women pre and pre process with Minister Bennett, Minister Wilson, and Minister uh, Haidu, we crossed, uh, I did nine of those facilitations across Canada. And in every single facilitation, the women, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, aunties said, why can they not see us as human beings? Why can they not see us as human beings? That is a very profound feeling across the entire country that Indigenous people shared. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Mike Van Hahn, um, who would like to ask a question. Mike? Thank you, Denise. And um, thank you, Dr. Wesley Eskimo. It's um, great to be here. And I feel that uh, what you've given me is a gift and, and what you've given all of us is a gift. I've got lots of questions, um, too many, in fact, maybe a comment and a question, uh, and two-part question. Comment being, you know, as I think about the journey that we have, have yet to do on, in reconciliation, all the pain that has been caused, especially caused by non-Indigenous people and now has been transmitted, um, I often wonder if, if that pain that has been caused is due to a lot of other pain within non-Indigenous people that's not been transformed and oh, needs to be yeah. transformed as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and sometimes that gets a bit overwhelming to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my question to you is, as we think about reconciliation, the journey we have to take together, what is your greatest doubt and what is your greatest hope? Well, you know, you know, when you said what you said, first of all, um, is um, it is interesting to me because my uh, one of my daughters took uh, English literature as her master's degree. And she said, Mom, I understand. I think I understand what happened in Canada based on the literature that I've read from Europe and the, the dysfunction that was present in uh, sexually and socially. She said there were many instances where I told my teacher, I'm not reading that book because I don't want that stuff in my head. And you're right, there's a lot of unhealedness in the European population as well, who have gone through residential schools themselves, who have gone through a lot of wars and a lot of tearing apart and the bubonic plagues and you name it, right? So yeah, it's not like indigenous peoples are the only ones that have to heal. Absolutely not. You know, I think we've done an admirable job of recognizing and acknowledging the fact that we do need to heal and have made lots of uh, steps forward to do that. I've been working in this field for, 40 years, <laughs> and I've certainly been involved in the healing process for, you know, and the work that, that the healing uh, community is doing for at least uh, 25 or 30 years. 
So I know very much that that's a part of it. Um, I, you know, my biggest doubt, I guess, is that it'll happen soon. I think it's going to take a couple lifetimes, uh, you know, more generations of work. And, and our children being born today have an opportunity. If we do it right and we really and we and we teach them and we understand and we put it in schools so that they grow up understanding that Canada has a history, I think we'll get there. But I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. Um, my greatest hope is that is that our children have the opportunities that have been denied them, that people stop seeing Indigenous people as, you know, through a stereotypical lens, you know, that they that they can, you know, understand their own biases and beliefs. And they can and they can and they can see past that that they that they acknowledge their own barriers to acceptance and and i'm not saying that indigenous people don't have that i mean i was raised in a household that that like whites did this to us they did that to us they took you know i was raised like that and both my parents being in residential school education was something that they really never they didn't say when you go to university you know when you get an education to them, education meant only one thing, and it had lots to do with 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 fear. So, um, you know, my greatest hope is that our children will be raised in a in an environment that says, you know, they want education in two ways. They want the education of their traditional values, cultures, languages, customs, beliefs, and they and they can walk in the Western world with 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 ease and acceptance. But we have to re return to the land and. The prophecies have told us that, that you're going to come to a time as human beings, all of us, where we'll have to choose between AI and technology and going back to the land. And, the, and I think the pandemic has taught us something about that, how important it is for us to, to touch. You know, everybody does land acknowledgements, right? I've challenged MPs. I'm like, you guys do land acknowledgements because it costs you nothing. You're like, oh, we want to acknowledge the land. You know, but I said, but when, you, when we ask you to change the citizen's oath, to acknowledge Indigenous peoples, it's been six years and you can't seem to get that done because that's going to cost you something, right? People are going to challenge you. So uh, my hope is that that process of education that we're talking about is not only going to happen, it's going to be embraced and we will become a better country and we will truly be peacekeepers on the world stage that will be have our governance and our justice framed in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Because we got overrepresentation in jails of our young people, overrepresentation of our children in, in wealth, child welfare, overrepresentation of women in our prisons, 42%. Although they only represent like 3% of the population. So there's a lot that um, I think Canadians have sort of done this to because it, they could and now they can't. Thank you. Uh, question on record keeping. Are records being kept that are accurate, uh, but are safeguarded from systemic racism? Being that settler systems of data can discriminate, how can we help to keep accurate records for Indigenous people in social systems? Yeah, th that's a really big question. Um, you know, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation was actually formed out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to be an archive for Indigenous records. And the support for that is a very important part of the, of, the, of the process for Canadians. You know, you can't, we have records everywhere and the churches have denied the right of us having those records, they, they've said no. So that's one of the things that we're asking Canadians to say is yes, the churches must give up their records and send them into a, a national archive so that people can access them. And they're hiding, what are they, what are they hiding, right? You know, we need to be able to see those records. So, um, and, and the National Center has, um, has the capacity to do that. They've been funded to, to build that and they've been working. With, that's where a lot of the children that have been identified since the TRC are now coming forward from. So we have to support those kinds of archives that have been established to do exactly that. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to invite Michael Fox. Hi, Michael. Hi, it's good to see you. I haven't yeah. seen you on. I, see, I haven't seen you on the trail there for a while. <laughs> I um, so you know, uh, I I work with Indigenous communities uh, across Canada, and um, so uh, some of them has uh, reached out to me on on um, uh, on uh, the repatriation mm. uh, of two people. So 
they actually did the, the research. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it was an historian, uh, what have you. So they did that front end part to find where uh, uh, the kids were and where they were buried. So one was buried in uh, Geraldton or Greenstone area and they wanted to look out. And now they want to repatriate the body because uh, mm -hmm. they weren't given a proper burial in an indigenous right. ceremony, you know? Uh, and so <laughs> because I'm a practical guy, uh, and I move things along. I'm realizing the clep, the complexities mm -hmm. of that. And and I, I when the phrase ground penetrating radar, because we use that in the field mm -hmm. for for our environmental assessment um, uh, work, um, and uh, the, the 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 expertise around that, the you know the, the to to do to to move it and then to read the actual um, uh, data set mm -hmm. as well as um, you know, uh, um, the professionally uh, licensed archaeologists, you know, to, mm -hmm. to move uh, human remains or exhume. And then the protocol about mobilizing that into a remote community uh, and, and the reburial. And then I'm looking at, like, I, I you know, because I was reading through all the regulations, you know, there, there, there's bodies like the Bouyvement Authority of Ontario, um, the, the Funeral Burial S S Cremation Act, like uh, there's, there's these directives um, I'm just so I, I think of these other communities as I'm I, you know this is all pro bono work like I'm just trying to move something along for them that I, if there was a role for universities you know to help create a roadmap uh, given that mm -hmm. you know the federal government you know laid out 27 million dollars and just recently the, the Ontario government 10 million dollars yeah. they really need a roadmap and, and I think I'm a you know a practical guy smart guy it's more complex than just you know mm -hmm. identifying bodies like the research and the historian part yeah. and then actually trying to move it and then if it's inside the boundaries of a cemetery or outside there's protocols yeah. around that yeah. um on, on, uh, so i just i just curious if there was a role for for lakehead or others um, to help uh, other communities because i'm just a one one right. person trying to help thanks yeah there, the, the, and there is there is a, and there is actually a role and lakehead has played a role so i you know i have said a few people to scott hamilton and said you know he's he was a part of the earlier process of actually when I mean, they were flying over areas and they can apparently see in the in the canopy of the trees where it's lower like they can actually identify where people where, where burial sites are by 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 air and then of course now they're doing the ground searches right so yeah the, the universities i think have committed to be a part of this process in fact that was part of the when i was saying that there's a, a collaborative effort so, you know, the National Center, you know, the UVic and UBC and, you know, people are actually stepping forward because they have, they have anthropologists on staff that are, are, are interested and willing to be of assistance in this area. But you're right, there's all these different acts that have, uh, that stand in the way. I think the government is aware of that and is, you know, part of the resourcing will be about providing that support, but it's not enough because, you know, one community might require, you know, a million or two dollars, depending on the size or where it's got to go with the hoops it's got to jump through. Um, there was 33 million initially, there's 24 million left. Who, how is that going to be allocated to 632 or 35 First Nation communities, Métis people as well, and the Inuit, who have also spent, you know, have had considerable experience with the churches and with uh, residential schools and Indian hospitals. So this is a huge, huge undertaking. And I think um, just like the, um, the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, which they made the survivors sign before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process. And now the survivors are saying, we were duped. Like you made us sign this before we even had any understanding of how much and how big this was. You know how many people were impacted by any residential schools because you only talk to some of us and they signed this agreement and now they're saying whoa like you guys you know we were fooled into signing that so the covenant is sort of the same they're saying to the churches you can't just do this you know we have to be a part of this conversation or it's not going to be acceptable so there's money more monies that have to go in and again it's a canadian conversation in in, in you know how does it affect canada because there's no special, you know, over there fund for this work. It has to come out of the dollars that have been allocated from Treasury Board. And we can't take it away from the children. We can't take it away from, you know, from running systems like that are already in place. 
you know, because sometimes the government has said, well, we'll take money out of this and put it over there. It has to be new dollars. Because if we start taking it from places where it's actually been allocated, then we start to undermine those systems and our community struggle, our organizations struggle. So it's a, it's, a, it's a conversation for everyone to be engaged in. It's not gonna be easy. Thank you very much. So we are at uh, the end of our, um, our time, unfortunately. I, I feel like we have several comments and questions in the chat. Uh, which I will uh, make sure get to you. Uh, yeah, you can send them to me. Yeah, have yeah. a look at them. Yeah, um, some great suggestions, some great ideas, um, and certainly some of the questions people had similar sort of pieces around what can they do as um, you know individuals within the circles of influence that that they are part of. And I I use that term, but I think that's yeah. what I understood you to say is that think about who are the people that you are connected yeah. with, and then what can you do within those circles as yeah. a very good first step. So I would like to thank you um, very much for joining us to speak about this extremely challenging uh, conversation. Um, we know um, it has impacted, I would say, a country of people, yeah. either directly or indirectly. Yeah. Um, but it has been a, you know, a, I guess a, a difficult time, and and you know things are back into conversation again, or families are, you know back talking about things perhaps. Um, but uh, I just really would like to thank you uh, for joining us, for speaking with us, and um, you know, for, for taking the time and for doing the work that you do. You are tremendously busy. You're out there every single day, although on Zoom now. Um, but I know prior to Zoom, you were rarely in one city for more than a day or two. Um, because yeah. you, you do move across the country and speak with yeah all kinds of people from all kinds of places from governmental levels to schools i remember like a high school that you were speaking to at one point um, and i know that that work is really a work of, of deep deep commitment so i would just like to on behalf of the uh, entire uh, group here today uh, thank you and uh, extend our deepest gratitude for the, the work yeah. that you made thank you and again thank you all of you for caring enough to to come here today and to listen to some pretty hard stuff, I know. <laughs>